Let it go. Because it'll come back to you if you let it go. But if you don't let it go, you'll just suffocate. The Buddha's doctrine is called the middle way, which is neither ascetic nor hedonistic. So it's summed up in what are called the four noble truths. And the first is called Dukkha. Dukkha means suffering in a very generalized sense. You could call it chronic frustration. And it is saying that life as lived by most people is dukkha. It is an attempt, in other words, to solve insoluble problems. Try to draw a square circle. You can't, because the problem itself is meaningless. Try to arrange the things in this room so that they're all up and none of them down. It is meaningless. Such a problem cannot ever be solved. So try to have light without dark or dark without light. It can never be solved. So the attempt to solve problems that are basically insoluble and to work at it through your whole life, that is dukkha. Now, he went on to analyze this, that there are what he called three signs of being. The first is dukkha itself, frustration. The second is anitya. The letter A in Sanskrit at the beginning of a word is often the equivalent of our non. So, nitya means permanent. Anitya means impermanent. That every manifestation of life is impermanent. And therefore, our quest to make things permanent, to straighten everything out, to get it fixed, is an impossible and insoluble problem. And therefore, we experience dukkha, or this sense of fundamental pain and frustration as a result of trying to make things permanent. And the third sign of being is called anatman. The word atman means self. Anatman means therefore non-self. That there is in you no real ego. The idea of the ego is a social institution. It has no physical reality. The ego is your symbol of yourself. Just as the word water is a noise which symbolizes a certain <laughs> liquid reality, so the idea of the ego, the role you play, who you are, is not the same as your living organism. Your ego has absolutely nothing to do with the way you color your eyes, shape your body, circulate your blood. That's the real you. But it's certainly not your ego, because you don't even know how it's done from the standpoint of your conscious attention. So the idea of anatman is firstly that the ego is unreal. There isn't one. Now then, this then is the first truth. There is this situation that we have dukkha or frustration because we are fighting the changingness of things and because we don't realize that the ego, the I, is unreal. The second of the Four Noble Truths is then called Krishna. Krishna is 
a Sanskrit word again and is the root of our word thirst. And it's usually translated desire, but it is better translated clinging, grabbing, or there's an excellent modern American slangy word, hang up. That is exactly what Trishna is, a hang up. Trishna is clutching. As for example, uh, what we call smother love. When uh, a mother is so afraid that her children may get into trouble, that she protects them excessively. And as a result of this, prevents them from growing. Or when lovers cling to each other excessively and have to sign documents that they will curse and swear to love each other always, they are in a state of Trishna. And this is the same thing as holding on to yourself so tightly that you strangle yourself. The second truth then about Trishna is that the cause of Dukkha is Trishna. Clinging is what makes suffering. If you don't recognize that this whole world is a phantasmagoria, an amazing illusion, a weaving of smoke, and you try to hold on to it, you see, then you start suffering, seriously suffering. Now, in breathing, you know that breath is life. The Greek word, you may pronounce it pneuma or pnefma, is the same as spirit. And spirit means breath in the book of Genesis when God had made the clay figurine that was later to be Adam, he breathed the breath of life into its nostrils and it became alive because life is breath. But now, if you hold your breath, you lose it. He that would save his life will lose it. So breathe in, breathe in, breathe in, get as much air as you can and Trishna cling and you lose it. So nirvana means breathe out. What a relief that was. <laughs> the sigh of relief. Let it go. Because it'll come back to you if you let it go. But if you don't let it go, you'll just suffocate. So a person in the state of nirvana is what we might call a blown out person. Like blow your mind. <laughs> Let go. Don't cling. And then you're in the state of nirvana. Now then the fourth noble truth, it's called marga. This word means path and the way of Buddhism is often called the Noble Eightfold Path because there are eight phases. I won't say steps because they're not sequential. They're all simultaneous. Once upon a time, there's a very, very great Japanese scholar, D.T. Suzuki who was giving a lecture at the University of Hawaii on Buddhism and was explaining he'd come to the fourth noble truth. And he said, today we come to fourth noble truth called a noble eightfold path. First step of noble eightfold path called shoken, he was using Japanese name. Shoken mean right view. Aura Buddhism is right view. Right view mean no particular view. No fixed view. Or Buddhism. Shoken, right view. 
Second step of an over eight foot bath. Oh, I forget second step. You look it up in the book. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to bother you with all the individual steps of the eightfold path. It really, uh, all of them are subsumed under three headings, of which uh, you can say that right view, which in Sanskrit is samyak. Samyak is a very curious phrase. It doesn't mean right in our sense of correct. Sam is the same really as our word sum. Total, complete, all inclusive. We might use the word integrated as when we say a person has integrity. That a person who has integrity, we mean he's all of a piece. He's not divided against himself. So, in this sense of samyak, drishti, this is related to the word darshan, which means a point of view or viewing. When you go to visit a great guru or teacher, you have darshan, you look at him, and you offer your reverence to him, this darshan many senses of it, but it means simply to view. Look at the view. So the Samyak Darshan is the complete view. For example, let's take the constellation called the Big Dipper. We look at it from a fairly restricted zone in space, and it always seems, whatever the season of the year, because we're so far away from it, that those stars in the Big Dipper are in the same position. But imagine looking at it from somewhere else in space altogether, and those stars would not look like a dipper. They'd be in another position. Now then, what is the true position of those stars? Don't you see there isn't one? Because wherever you look, the position alters. You could say that the true situation of those stars is how they are looked at from all points of view, all possible points of view. Inside the constellation, looking outwards, outside the constellation, looking inwards, from everywhere and everywhere. But you see, there is no such thing as the truth. The world, in other words, is not existing independently of those who witness it because the world is precisely the relationship between the world and its witnesses. Just as the sound of a drum is the relationship between a striking hand and the skin. If there's no skin on the drum, it doesn't make any sound. And so if there are no eyes in this world, the sun doesn't make any light, nor do the stars. So what is, is a relationship. You can, for example, prop up two sticks by leaning them against each other, and they will stand. But only by depending on each other. Take one away and the other falls. So in Buddhism, it is taught that everything in this universe depends on everything else. That we have a kind of a huge network and this is called the doctrine of mutual interdependence. All of it hangs on you, and you hang on all of it, just as the two sticks support each other. And this is conveyed in a symbol which is called Indra's net. Imagine a multidimensional spider's web in the early morning covered with dewdrops. And every dewdrop contains the reflection of all the other dewdrops. And in each reflected dewdrop, the reflections of all the other dewdrops in that reflection. And so ad infinitum. 
That is the Buddhist conception of the, of the universe in an image. The Japanese call that Jiji Muge. A Ji means a thing event, a happening. So between happening and happening, Mu, there is no Ge separation. Jiji Muge. Now, the first phase of the Eightfold Path has to do with one's view, understanding of the world. The second phase has to do with action, how you act. And here we get the Buddhist view of behavior. A Buddhist doesn't base his ethics on the idea of commandments, of orders from a higher echelon of authority. Buddhist idea of ethics is based on expediency. If you are engaged in the way of liberation and want to clarify your consciousness, doing that is inconsistent with certain kinds of action. So every Buddhist makes five vows, five precepts. And you may perhaps have heard the Buddhist formula of taking what is called Panchasila, the five precepts. And they take uh, what are called Tisarana, the three refuges and the five precepts. The refuges are the Buddha, the Dharma, the doctrine, and the Sangha, the fellowship of all those who are on the way. So the priest, the bhikkhu, the uh, Buddhist monk, and the lay people will chant the formula. Buddhanga sarananga chami, Dhanghanga sarananga chami, Sanghanga sarananga chami. Those are the three refuges, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Then the third phase has to do with your mind, with your state of consciousness. And this has to do with what we would ordinarily call meditation. There are the two final, the, the seventh and eighth aspects of the path are called Samyak Shmriti and Samyak Samadhi. Shmriti means recollection. That's the best English word for it. Now, do you understand the word recollect is to gather together what has been scattered. What is the opposite of remember? Obviously dismember. What has been chopped up and scattered becomes remembered. So in the Christian scheme, do this in remembrance of me. You see, the Christ has been sacrificed, chopped up. But the Mass is celebrated in remembrance. One of the old liturgies says the wheat which has been scattered all over the hills and grows up is gathered again into the bread remembered. Go back to your Hindu basis. The world is regarded as the dismemberment of the self. Remembered into the many. So remembrance is realizing again that each single member of the many is really the one. So that's recollection. Hey, thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then I think you'll love this one too.